Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Monday evening Theravada class of the Buddhist Society, uh, virtual Buddhist Society meeting. Um, it's nice to see you all join us. Um, we're very fortunate in having Achan Chandasiri uh, lead the class this evening. Um, I'll just read a few introductory words uh, for those who may not be familiar with her. She's Scottish by birth and like Achan Sundra, uh, was one of the first nuns to be ordained by Achan Sumedha at Chittas Monastery. Having been raised as a, as a Christian, she continues to appreciate contact with contemplative Christians and with those of other faiths. Uh, recognizing the immense benefit both for herself and others that can come about through a life of renunciation, she has actively participated in the evolution of the training and in providing opportunities for women to experience this form of practice. For most of her monastic life, she has been resident at either Chittapiveka or Amaravati monasteries. At the moment, she's in Nguyen, Hermitage, up in Scotland. Uh, and thanks to the miracles of modern technology, we have her as our teacher this evening. So I'd like to welcome you very warmly, Sister. Thank you for joining us. And um, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And uh, good evening, everybody. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to participate in this evening's class, this opportunity for all of us to uh, settle ourselves a little bit using the teachings and practices of Theravada Buddhism. Um, so I'm here at Miltium Hermitage in our shrine room with the beautiful Buddha Rupa that came from Myanmar, from Burma, uh, way back in 2011 when I first came here. Came in the back of a van and it took five people all their strength to get it up the stairs and onto the shrine. So here we are. And what we'll do as usual is first of all, I'll light the candles and incense uh, as the formal uh, offerings to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. And then we'll chant the um, part of the evening chanting, which uh, Wandu will uh, put up on the screen so you can follow along. Uh, please stay unmuted if you do decide to follow along. That would be helpful because it doesn't really work. That's one of the things that doesn't work with Zoom is uh, trying to chant together. I'll be chanting in Pali this evening, so you won't understand it. Um, but for those of you who have participated in, in these pujas over, over the years, um, my sense is that it's something that it actually has a resonance in the heart, not so much the head, but in the heart. And so I hope you'll enjoy this opportunity to, to chant virtually together. So I'll turn to the shrine to, to light the candles and incense. Sangho, 
Ammayang Bhagavantang Sadammang Sasankhang Himehi Sakare Hiyatarahang Aropite Hiyavipojayama Satu no Bhante Bhagavā Suchirakarini Bhutoke Pachima Janata Nukam Pamanasa Dime Sakare Dukata Panakarabote Pati Kang Patu Amhakang Dikaratang Hitaya Sukaya Arahang Samma Sambodho Bhagawa Bhutang Bhagawantang Abhiwa Dengi Suvakato Bhagawata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Savata Sanko Sankang Yamami Andamayam Bodhasa Bhagavato Pupapaganama Karan Paroma Sahe Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa Tamayam Bodha Nur Satinayam Karoma Sahe Tanko Panam Bhagawan Tange Wan Kanaya Nuti Tisato Hapo Kato Iti Piso Bhagawan Samma Samboto Vichacharana sampanno sukato laka vidu Anuttaro purisadhamma sarapisa Tadeva manusanam poto bhagavati Andamayam Dhamma Pnu Satinayam Karoma Sahe Suvakatur Bhagavata Dhammo Sandipiko Akaliko Edipasiko Opanayiko Pachatang Vedita Bovinyu Hiti Andamayam Sankha Bhitu Tinkaroma Sahe Supati Pannu Bhagavato Sawata Sankho Uchupati Pannu Bhagavato Sawata Sankho Yaya Pati Pannu Bhagavato Sawata Sankho Samichi Pati Pannu Bhagavato Sawata Sankho Yati Dhang Chatari Purisa Yukani Yata Purisa Pogala Esa Bhagavato Sawata Sankho Ahuneyo Pahuneyo Tatineyo Hanchani Karaniyo 
นุตรังพุญญาเทตังโลกาสัตติโอ้ช่ s ง to um contemplate the uh, the resonance of these sounds, recollecting the qualities of the of the Buddha, the enlightened being who lived 2,500 years ago, contemplating our capacity to come to that same understanding in our own lives, understanding the nature of existence. Understanding the way to live without suffering, contemplating the Dhamma, the teachings that the Buddha gave, that pointed to the way that we come to that realization, we come to that understanding. Dhamma also, of course, means truth as we experience it here and now. And the Sangha, those countless women and men, who over the years have. Contemplated the teachings, applied the teachings in their own lives, and found benefit, just as we today are contemplating the teachings and finding benefit uh, as we as we walk the path of the Buddha, uh, walk the path to perfect liberation from every kind of suffering. So, contemplating these teachings is one way of, kind of lifting up the heart. And another really important recollection, which I encourage at the start of every class, is the um, recollection of the precepts, and uh, to take the opportunity to re-establish, to reaffirm our commitment to living according to these guidelines, uh, to refrain from uh, unhelpful uh, speech and behaviour, to refrain from killing. Anything, uh, certainly not human beings, and if possible, to avoid killing insects, small creatures, bigger creatures, to avoid deliberately uh, causing the death of any living creature, to avoid stealing, taking what hasn't been given to us, what we have no right to, cheating, and so on, uh, to avoid sexual misconduct, so we treat our dear ones with respect uh, and kindness. And take advantage of them, take advantage of others in unhelpful ways. Uh, to refrain from wrong speech, not lying, not gossiping, not causing division, not hurting people through harsh speech or uh, wrong speech of any kind, abusive speech, and refraining from the use of intoxicants, uh, which cloud the mind, which confuse the mind, uh, which. Um, Can lead to a loss of restraint, a loss of a sense of what's appropriate at any given time. So we keep clarity, an understanding of where we are, who we're with, what's appropriate, what's kind, what's helpful, what's supportive, and avoid things that are harmful to ourselves and to others. So we'll do this quite formally, and I believe that Nick is going to make the formal request, and then uh, we can all. Uh, determine the precepts together. I'll, I'll, I'll lead us in determining the precepts and the refuges. Maya Maya, Tisa Lena Saha, Pancha Silani Achama, Dutiampi Maya Maya, Tisa Lena Saha, Pancha Silani Achama, Tatiampi Maya Maya, Tisa Lena Saha. Pancha Silani Achama. Namo Etasa Bhagavato Harahato Samma Sampodhasa. Namo Etasa Bhagavato Harahato Samma Sampodhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Harahato Samma Sambodhasa. 
Namo tassa bhagavatu arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavatu arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavatu arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang saranangka chami. Buddham Saranam Gachami. Dhammang Saranam Gachami. Dhammang Saranam Gachami. Sanghang Saranam Gachami. Sanghang Saranam Gachami. Dutiyampi Buddhang Saranam Gachami. Dutiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Ye saranakamana nititang. Amabante. Oh, sorry, aye. Apologies. <laughs> Anati Pata, where Pani Sikapadang Samadi Hami Anati Pata, where Pani Sikapadang Samadi Hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adinna dana where money seek up at Ang Samadi Hami. Adinna dana where money seek up at Ang Samadi Hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Tame sumi chachara, where of money seek up at Ang Samadi Hami. Tame sumi chachara, where many seek up at Ang Samadi Hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musawada, where of money seek up at Ang Samadi Hami. Musawada, where of money seek up at Ang Samadi Hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. Dura Miraya Majapamada Tana, where of money seek up at Ang Samadi Hami. Sura Miraya Majapamada Tana, where of money seek up at Ang Samadi Hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs, which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha si kapadani si lena sukha tingyanti si lena boga sampada si lena nibu tingyanti tasama si langwi sotaye Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> Thank you. So these precepts are the um, basically the foundation for our life. You know what we do in our daily life. Uh, 
how we live, how we relate with one another, how we relate with our, our duties and our responsibilities, our friends, our families, our jobs, and so on. Um, and they support also our relationship with ourselves, because when we live as best we can following these precepts, these guidelines, there's a sense of, of ease. It, it supports a sense of inner ease, a sense of self-respect, which is not there if we're cruel and selfish and take advantage of other people. Then we have a feeling of guilt, a feeling of shame, a feeling of fear that you know, maybe somebody will find out. So although they seem very simple, they actually have a very profound effect on our minds, on our hearts, and they can completely transform our lives. They also support our meditation practice because when we live without regret, without fear, uh, the mind is more inclined to settle. And so what we'll do now is we'll spend a little bit of time in meditation um, using the breath, using the body as a focus for our awareness, just to support a, a, a settling and an attunement to our own minds and bodies. Rather than being drawn out to things out there, we, we bring the attention inwards uh, to the body and the mind. So I encourage you to take a little time to find a suitable posture. I'm going to sit cross-legged. And if you can do that, that's, that's a good posture, or you may prefer to kneel or sit on a chair. So it's good to have a firm, a firm base. So we're aware of our contact with the flare chair or the floor or cushion, whatever. And also a sense of uprightness. So we try to hold the body as nice and upright as we can. And if we are sick, if we need to lie down, well, that's fine too. We could still practice awareness of the body even when we're lying down. So to really underline that we're not trying to make the mind quiet, we're not trying to get rid of thoughts, not trying to do anything in particular other than to uh, just be aware, to be present with things as they are. just calmly observing, observing the body, how it feels, relaxing the body. I usually use the breath, the idea of breathing through, relaxing, releasing tension from the different parts of the body. In the head, the shoulders, the arms and hands, the chest area, the belly, into the legs. Just taking a little time to just notice how the body is. And to almost to, to invite a settling, a calming. Seeing this is a time when Nothing else is being asked of us other than to attend to our own body and mind with a sense of kindliness, a sense of acceptance, a sense of confidence. There may be chattering in the mind. In fact, there probably will be chattering in the mind. There'll be recollections of what's happened during the day Maybe thoughts, plans for the future, concerns, worries about what might happen. And we can just leave that be. We don't have to struggle to get rid of it, fight with it. Just leave it be. And bring the awareness to the breath. 
Notice how the body breathes. Just enjoy the sensations of the body breathing. Seeing this process of breathing as a, a way of bringing subtle kind of nourishment to the whole body, refreshing the body, refreshing the mind. Attuning to the breath in this way, a calming, soothing sensations in the body allows, enables a settling of the mind. If you find it helpful to use a, a word or a short phrase as an additional support, as an additional reminder, then by all means do that, linking the word or the phrase with the breath, either with each breath or just from time to time. Even such simple words as breathing in as you breathe in, Breathing out as you breathe out. Attuning to the breath. Attuning to the body. Attuning to Dhamma. This moment. Here. Now. Of course, we need to be rather patient because at the end of a busy day, the mind naturally will be rather busy. So we breathe, we enjoy the process of breathing, allowing the busyness to settle on its own. Enjoying the in-breath, the feeling of the chest cavity, the body, the belly, all expanding. As the air is drawn into the lungs, allowing a very full, complete out-breath, just in its own time, the body breathes out. Calming, settling. Attending to the pauses, the pause between the in and the out breath. The pause when we've breathed out fully before the next in breath. Allowing the body to find its own natural rhythm.
you notice at any time that the mind has slipped away following some interesting idea or plan or concern. Uh, simply having noticed that, re-establish the present moment awareness. Come back to the breath. Always with a sense of beginning again. Calmly. And with a sense of pleasure. Sense of enjoyment. Keeping it all rather simple. There's nothing we need to work out or understand on the intellectual level. Just being here now. With the breath, with the body, as it is. Keeping the mind bright, alert, attentive. If you're feeling dull or sleepy, try opening the eyes, sitting up nice and straight, using the in breath to energize, brighten, enliven the whole system. You're feeling very restless, agitated, tense. Then we focus on the out breath, calming, settling.
just one breath. And then the next breath. We calm the mind as the mind settles. We become aware, attuned to the heart. The jitta. There can be a sense of warmth, a sense of inner ease, well being. And as we practice, we can just allow this radiance of the heart to fill the whole of our being. 
metta, kindliness. You can use words or a phrase. May this being be well. Or you can just enjoy the feelings kind of in a glow. Warmth, ease, well-being. And gradually allow it to extend beyond this form sitting here. A radiance filling the space around us. May this being be well. May others be well. Our dear ones, the ones we share our, our space with. The ones who live far away. Allowing this intention of kindliness to extend to them. Visualizing them, naming them. Whatever seems feels meaningful. Just taking a little time. May just be one being, a brother, a sister, parent, child. May they be well. May they be free from every kind of suffering. Extending to those people that we know, our friends, our colleagues, our communities. Again, with the same intention, the same sense, allowing this metta, this radiance from the heart Touch them, to imbue them with a sense of ease and sense of well-being. May this being be well, may they be well. Free from every kind of suffering. Extending too to those who we know who are sick, dying, bereaved, struggling mentally or physically with some kind of disturbance or ailment. Bringing them too to mind, visualizing them, naming them. Allowing this radiance from the heart to extend and to imbue them with a sense of ease, well-being, inner steadiness, balance. And extending now to all those beings who we don't know, who we know of, who are sick, who are struggling, who are stressed. Those living in situations of conflict or violence in different parts of the world, living in states of deprivation, fear, starvation. In whatever way you can, allowing this energy of metta, of kindliness, to touch them. In whatever way is meaningful for you, 
may they also be well, find inner ease, balance. Extending even to those beings who we don't have a good feeling about. The rulers, well, beings in positions of great power, who perhaps are misusing their power. Beings who have great responsibility, who may not understand what that implies. in our own way, wishing the very best for them too. We may not like what they do, but they're human beings. They're struggling. Our intention is that they too may find inner ease balance, the wisdom, the compassion, to fulfill their responsibilities, to use their power for the welfare of all. encompassing the entire planet, the human beings, the animals, the plants, the earth, the atmosphere, the waters. May all beings everywhere exist in a state of balance, a state of well-being. and extending out into the vast universe. May this being be well, may others be well. And little by little, we come back to our own bodies, sitting here, breathing. May I be well. May I be liberated from every kind of struggle. May there be inner ease, balance.
Reflecting on this quality of balance, Upeka, one of the um, most exacting uh, qualities, the most difficult uh, aspect of our practice is finding balance uh, with the different situations that we encounter in our lives. Uh, and often we're asked questions about you know, how we can find the proper balance, uh, say, in our own lives, you know, between looking after ourselves and looking after others, uh, the inner and outer work, uh, finding the balance between uh, being kind of over severe, over critical, or too soft. You know, our whole life seems to be a kind of balancing. And uh, I sometimes reflect on, on the Eightfold Path where I uh, talk about Sama Diti, Sama Sankapa, Sama Wacha, Sama Kamanto, Sama 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 Ajivo, Sama Wayamo, Sama Sati, Sama Samadhi. And uh, this is often translated as, as right, right for you right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right mindfulness, right collectedness or concentration, gathering the mind. And what occurs to me is a slightly heretical kind of thought of well, there's no right. There's no right or wrong. It's much more a question of a, a balance. It's not a fixed thing. What may be right in some circumstances is completely wrong in other circumstances. In fact, Ajahn Chah is often quoted, and I may have said this before, often quoted as saying it's like, you know, if you see somebody walking along a path and they're veering off to the right, then you say, go left come to the middle, come to the, you know, find the balance in the middle, the point of balance. And if they're going off to the left, then they say, go right, go right. But they go, come back to the middle, find a middle way. So it's not that the instructions, you know, go right or go left are incorrect, um, but it's a matter of, relating to them to the circumstances, the, to the particular circumstances. You know, what's appropriate, what's suitable uh, in the circumstances, what, what brings the best, uh, the most beneficial result. You know, sometimes being very severe, very strong is what's needed. Sometimes being very soft, very light, very gentle is what's needed. You know, whether we're responding to our own working with our own minds or whether we're responding to something external to us. Uh, it's a matter of reading the situation and then applying uh, the appropriate uh, response. Sometimes we don't know what, what, what's needed. We don't know how we can help. And interesting these days we hear, you know, for the last couple of years there's been all kinds of things about the pandemic you know, and all the precautions we're supposed to take and different views and opinions about, about these things. And now that's kind of 
faded and now of course it's the war in Ukraine that seems to be the main thing that we're hearing about through the media and you know, a lot of people are immensely concerned about the impressions that they receive, the news that they receive through the media, a sense of real, genuine and appropriate concern. And some people get very angry, very upset, want to, want to you know, wanting to punish, wanting to you know, set things straight in some way. Um, and uh, I've been contemplating this. Because people ask me, you know, about how to how to respond, and you know, what what can we do? As, as Buddhist practitioners, you know, is there anything we do? What should we do? Should, you know, should we just sit back and, and send kindness? You know, is that the appropriate thing? Just spread metta as we've just been doing. Is, is that what we can do? Or should we be more active? Should we demonstrate? Should we be writing to the politicians? What, what can we do? And the same with you know, um, you know, the, the, the climate situation. When I think about things, I can feel really indignant and you know, must something must be done. I need to go and talk to these people. I, I've got a big thing about going and you know, talking to people. Uh, you know. And you know, so far the situation hasn't arisen where I've been able to go and talk to any of these people in power, tell them what I think. Um, so and that's the same for, 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 for most of us. You know, we're not, we don't really, there isn't the opportunity to, um, to do anything that we may feel could have a real effect, could have a real influence. And it's very easy to you know, tumble into a state of, of pessimism, of um, you know, cynicism, of feeling just giving up. You know, there's nothing we can do, hopeless. Or we may just think, well, you know, everybody's doing this, so I'll do it. And everybody's watching TV, getting fed with all these things and feeling angry and indignant. And maybe I'll just you know, fall, fall into that way of responding. But as we all know, getting angry and indignant doesn't do anybody any good. Neither does allowing the mind to be overwhelmed with worry, you know, fear, anxiety about the future. That doesn't seem to bring much benefit either. You know, if we look at the effect in our own hearts of a lot of worry or a lot of anger, a lot of righteous indignation, a lot of rage, a lot of vindictiveness, uh, you know, wanting to punish, wanting to hurt people who are hurting others. I mean, we may feel that we're doing something, <laughs> we're minding, we're caring, we're, we're getting upset about it. But does that really benefit anybody? It might satisfy the sense of, you know, feeling, the, feeling, an, appropriate, uh, feeling an appropriate rage, does that really help? I think not. It's understandable, completely understandable. Some of the things we hear are just appalling. But I was quite touched yesterday here at Milne Tune. We had a meditation day and we were very fortunate we had Ajahn Sujito came and stayed for a week and offered many teachings about different themes, but one of the most interesting comments was from one of the people attending the day who said, well, you know, really we don't, we don't actually know what's really going on. All we know is what we hear, what we read in the papers. You know, we, we don't really know. We don't really know all the things that are going on behind the scenes. We don't really know the kind of pressures that people are, are under. And I don't say this to excuse anybody, but just to um, maybe just cast some kind of doubt on whether 
in fact, our anger, our rage, our concerns, our worries are really um, well placed. Um, maybe we, maybe um, it's better if we actually just bring the attention into our own hearts and do what we can do here. I have a great faith in the triple gem, in the power of truth, actually. The Dhamma, the truth. The truth is that we don't know. The truth is that we feel helpless. The truth is that we feel upset, that we feel concerned. You know, we can recognize that. One of the difficulties about these things is we don't know what to do and we can feel frustrated and upset about that. So there can be dukkha at that very level. So perhaps we do something about that level of dukkha. Settle the heart, calm the heart. Recognize that sometimes we don't know. Okay, we don't know. Can I settle my heart with not knowing? Can I attune to Dhamma? When we can really allow an internal settling, there can be um, an attunement um, to truth and an attunement to the Buddha, to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, that can enable us to uh, appreciate what it is that we can do. to respond to the situations that life presents us with. To attune to and to work with our uh, internal uh, confusion, our internal fear, our internal rage, our internal vindictiveness, wanting to punish, wanting to hurt. Settling that, there's a clarity, a sense of calm, a sense of um, a wise concern. These people are struggling, these people are suffering. The people who are the victims are suffering, the oppressors are suffering. Those who are attuned to Dhamma, those who are wise, those who are inwardly at ease, don't need to hurt others, don't need to harm others. Don't need to be afraid that they're going to lose their position of power, that they're going to lose their wealth, that they're going to lose anything at all. If they understand that life as a human being, we're born and it ends in death where we lose everything. Nothing is worth holding on to, nothing is worth hating others for, fighting others for. So in this way we begin to, as we attune in this way, the heart can become much grander, much bigger. So rather than seeing them as the victims and the oppressors and hating the oppressors and feeling concerned uh, and uh, wanting to uh, support the, the victims, there's a sense of concern and a wanting to support, wanting to uh, bring calm, bring clarity also to the oppressors. May they see clearly. May they 
realize, may they fully appreciate the terrible, terrible harm that they're doing. May they see truth, may they find another way of living, another way of finding satisfaction. May they attune to Dhamma. Now this may not be something that is gonna bring an immediate uh, change in what we hear, what we see in the media. It may not have any effect at all, other than on our own hearts. But maybe this is the best thing that we can do for ourselves and for others. Those we meet, those around us, those who have contact with us. And who knows the extent to which somebody who is calm, somebody who is inwardly at ease, the extent to which them, this can affect others. Our dear ones, those we encounter, you know, those in, uh, other beings on the planet, I don't know. But I can't, I certainly can see that it's definitely worth doing. And it may be that we find ourselves in a position where we can have an influence. You know, some people have enormous talent, you know, writing, speaking, some, maybe we have opportunity to meet somebody who we can um, uh, uh, challenge certain assumptions they may express, some certain views they may hold. We, we don't know what kind of opportunities uh, can arise for us. So, these are just a few reflections from my own practice, my own uh, approach to these things. And um, I just invite you to consider them as a possibility uh, in our lives, in our practice, as we walk this eightfold path of the Buddha, perfect view, perfect understanding, suffering and the ending of suffering, balanced, perfect intention, the intention to, uh, refraining from the intention to cause harm to ourselves, to others, uh, to, to, to exploit others, to exploit the planet we live on perfect intention to speak with clarity, with truthfulness, in ways that are supportive, encouraging, by right? action to, uh, to do good, to avoid hurting, harming others or ourselves. If we can, to avoid a livelihood that's going to cause harm to ourselves and others. Putting forth effort to abandon what is unwholesome, unhelpful in our own minds and bodies, to cultivate what is wholesome, what is helpful, practicing restraint, mindfulness, clarity around our situation, where we are, who we're with, what's appropriate, and gathering the awareness. And when the mind is scattered in all directions, gathering the awareness, Focusing on what's before us and what we need to be attending to. So, as I said, these are a few for thoughts for our reflection, our consideration this evening. And uh, I offer these for your well being, happiness. And invite you to ask questions if anything that I've said seems odd or uh, unsatisfactory in any way or if you have other questions about your practice it doesn't have to be about what I've spoken about it can be about any aspect of practice we have a, a little bit of time and you can ask by sending a chat message or by raising a, a real or a virtual hand and I believe that Nick will invite you to unmute 
and ask your question. And I'm happy for us just to sit quietly for a few moments and see if anything arises that you would like to ask about. Thank you, Sister. If you don't mind, uh, I, I've got one that uh, is somewhat related to what uh, you were talking about. Okay. Nowadays, one can hear a number of Buddhists uh, saying that anger, after all, can be a, a force for good. It doesn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily negative and uh, it can spur one's own on the path and so on and so forth. What is uh, the forest Sangha view on that? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> we all get angry and there are always things to get angry about. Um, and it certainly is a very powerful energy. It energizes us. And it can also um, it's like a fire. It's also quite dangerous. It can do a lot of harm. So one of the things that Ajahn Sumedhu used to talk about a lot was righteous indignation. You know, where you see something that's obviously wrong and you get really fired up. And um, I don't know about you, but when I'm in a state of righteous indignation, you know, I can feel that anything is justifiable. <laughs> and it's not a very, in my opinion, not a very wholesome energy. The energy of anger needs to be understood and we need to learn how to direct it in a skillful way. And there's an absolutely wonderful verse in the Dhammapada that I've contemplated a lot because I haven't yet found a translation that makes real sense. And so I ended up looking into the dictionary to find, and I had a Pali version of the particular verse, and I looked in the dictionary to find, to see if there was a, a better translation than any of the ones I'd come across. And I, I found one, so I need to say a bit more about this. The verse is something like, uh, those who can manage their anger skillfully are like a charioteer who can, like a well-trained charioteer who can direct his chariot. Others just, and the, the translations are often said, uh, just, just keep their hands, just rest their hands on the reins, just let their anger go everywhere. The translation I found that I came up with is others just grip onto the reins. Um, so whether you just have your hands on the reins and just let the anger go everywhere, that's like one extreme, just letting your anger blast out without really having any regard for the consequences. The other thing that can happen, which is more what happens with me, I suppose, and maybe with other people, is that we grip onto the reins because Anger is a very frightening energy. And, you know, when I felt angry, sometimes I felt I could actually just blow up the whole universe. It can be that powerful. So you just, you, you frantically hold it in. Those of you who've ever ridden horses or been charioteers, maybe in a previous lifetime, will know that there's a way of managing that energy. Or if you've maybe, um, you know, lit, lit a fire, you know, if you've got a bonfire or a stove, you know that there's a way of managing the heat. You don't just let it go anywhere, but if you manage it, if you direct it carefully, you can use it. So what I would suggest is if there is a lot of internal anger that you um, find ways to stay with it 
and use it to focus the mind you know, um, internally. You know, get onto your walking path and just be with the body, be with the heart, be with the mind as you walk, you know, with a sense of, I mean, you might want to walk really, really fast, but as you do it, you may find that everything begins to calm and you begin to discern what's needed in the situation. So I think the Theravada approach would be to learn how to manage the anger, not to blast anybody, not to justify killing anybody. You know, Theravadans would never, well, I, the, certainly the forest tradition would be totally um, against um, killing somebody, however awful they were. Um, So I, I wouldn't recommend that you do that. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult question. And yesterday we were asked a question about, well, if it's for the greater good and so on. I, I think another question might, that I might ask in response would be, well, what is the greater good? Another quotation from the Dhammapada is, hatred never ceases through hatred. You know, if you're angry, and if you hate somebody because of the anger, if you're enraged, you want to harm them, that's not going to lead to peace or to mutual understanding. That's just going to create more of the same. So again, that's another verse that's often been mistranslated. I mean, they say, you know, hatred only ceases through love. Well, I think that's asking a bit much. Again, I looked into the Pali and I found that actually what it, what it means is that it only ceases through the willingness to abandon ill will. You know, somebody said one time, you know, killing people is, is much too gross. There are much uh, more refined ways of responding to these situations, much subtler ways where you can actually uh, show people what they're doing. Um, so, it's a difficult one, but I think, you know, actually speaking to speaking about it is helping me to become clearer that we would never justify uh, killing anybody or going against the precepts. The precepts are there for a purpose. And, uh, you know, they're very demanding, very exacting. But um, I think we have to, to take them quite seriously, to take them deep into the heart and really contemplate. And just noticing in your own life, you know, maybe you haven't killed people, um, but maybe you've been mean to somebody, maybe you've hurt somebody. You know, how does that feel? How do you feel when you've done something like that, when you've hurt somebody? You know, it may just be a look or a word. You know, as you practice meditation more and more, you're, 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 you become more sensitive. You know, sometimes, you know, living here at Miltium, it might be somebody staying here, I might say something, you know, a little bit sharp or a little bit mean. You know, and if I know that I've hurt somebody, I, I don't feel very good. So it's good to contemplate the effects of, of unmindfulness, of the unmindful uh, expression of something that might not be um, very kind, very helpful. So I'd be careful with this justification that sometimes there's a, a, a justification for, for harming others. Um, and I would encourage you to contemplate alternatives. Uh, be a little bit creative. Um, not, not gluing yourself to the motorway or anything like that because that causes an awful lot of disruption. <laughs> Although I, I, can, I can understand why people do it, but I think there's even more skillful ways that uh, you can bring attention to things. I'm, you know, I, I'm pondering this and I invite you to ponder it uh, because there are plenty of things that it would be wonderful if we could adjust. Um, but maybe we just have to be rather patient uh, with that sense of helplessness. Uh, and, you know, who knows? So. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> That's maybe a little bit helpful. Uh, is there anything else that anybody would like to ask about? Yes, I think um, Andy would like to ask a question. Would you like to unmute yourself, Andy? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, just following on from what you were saying about anger, um, the other side of that, uh, in my experience, is sort of feeling a great deal of, of sadness of situations that occur. And in I can relate in my own past sort of a sense of moral outrage has been a big fuel for action. And in terms of meeting with the Dharma and working on that skillfully, I do find myself, when you were reflecting about oppressors and victims, tears were coming to my eyes. And there's a, there's a tendency sometimes to sort of be drawn in that kind of sad, overwhelming sadness. I wondered if you had anything to speak to that extreme, please. Thank you for that question. Um, yes, well, it's, it's this thing of balance, isn't it? Um, you know, as, as human beings, there are times when there's grief and sorrow. As we become more sensitive through our meditation, we become more... Um, attuned to suffering that we hear about, that we see. And um, it can be difficult not to be completely overwhelmed. This is certainly the case. Um, so how to, how to deal with that? You know, when is it appropriate to give way to the sense of grief and sorrow, when, it's, when is it appropriate to um, practice restraint? Um, you know, I think for many people, you know, people particularly in the caring professions, uh, there's, there's there can often be a sense of overwhelm and um, very, I, th I think it's quite common though for people to deal with this through uh, shutting off, and not actually kind of numbing themselves, not allowing themselves uh, to feel the, the pain um, of others. You know, like, like doctors who have to, you know, um, deal with people who are really you know, very, very sick or dying or having to give bad news to relatives. I mean, that for, for doctors, that's, you know, every day, many times a day kind of thing they have to do to encounter that kind of level of human suffering. And, you know, if they really stayed attuned, you know, as uh, they, they, they just, just wouldn't be able to do it. Um, so it's a matter of actually knowing our capacity, I think, and learning how to look after ourselves. Yes. Because, you know, if, if you continuously shut down, you cut it off, then you can become very um, cold, um, almost, almost inhuman. I mean, you do your job very well, but you're not, you're not really attuning to the person. So that's not that's obviously not a good thing. On the other hand, if you get too involved, then you're you're totally ineffectual. So finding a way to balance, knowing knowing developing cultivating strategies. So I I often encourage people to try and be with nature. You know, if if, if you can be by the river, I love watching ducks. Actually, I find ducks very soothing. That's you know. Much of the time, I don't say always, but much of the time, their lives seem to be relatively simple. So they kind of float about, they bob about on the water, and then they 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 go to sleep. And just tuck their head under their wing wherever they are, and they can have a, a sleep. 
and they get up and then they do these little headstands and you know, get grubs and things from up the bottom of the pond or the water. So ducks and swans and beavers are quite comforting to watch as well. Um, the trees, nature, the sky. That can be very soothing for the heart. So if you are in a situation where you count a lot, when you're encountering a lot of that kind of suffering, then you take yourself to nature. If you watch a lot of TV and are seeing people suffering through that, then I'd really suggest that you either stop watching TV altogether or at least ration it. You know, ration the amount of bad news that you take in. Not because you don't care, but because you care too much. So finding a, a, mm -hmm. a measured, a way of measuring uh, the amount of suffering that you expose yourself to. I'd really encourage that for everybody, actually. You know, you can find out enough just in five minutes of turning on your iPod pad or your device, if you've, well, you've obviously got one because you're watching this. You just you know, get the headlines and if there's something particularly interesting, then look into that a little bit. But don't, don't spend too much time with that. It doesn't do you any good at all. So, it, as I said, it, it, it's a question of balance knowing your own capacity, not trying to take on or allowing yourself to be exposed to more than you can manage. Obviously, there are times when there are situations that you suddenly find yourself in, it's a terrible accident, something happens, and you see things that maybe, you know, are very, very shocking, and then you need to find ways of, of processing that. It's not easy. But in general, I suggest that the things that you can have control over, how much you read the papers, how much you watch the news, how much you talk about these things. You know, in Buddhism, we have this wonderful thing of just associating with the wise, associating with people who do have a, a sense of balance, a sense of perspective. Mm -hmm. We don't hang out with people who just love to gossip all the time, who, who, who get themselves upset about these things. Um, so I don't mean to sound dismissive, but more um, a case of learning how to look after your own heart, um, wherever you may be, because you know it, it can be too much you know, for, for, for any of us. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if that, that makes sense or answers the question adequately, but um, as I said, I really, I really thank you for the question because I, um, in fact, both questions are very um, relevant. Uh, particularly now that we seem to be having so much uh, information coming about really, really, really tragic and difficult situations. Um, so just keep, keep going in. You have the capacity to access the most profound wisdom and understanding and the most profound uh, compassion um, you know, if, 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 if we all just keep going with our, our meditation every day, keep practicing, keep contemplating the Buddha and the teachings of the Buddha, um, and also just recognizing our limitations. I mean, even the Buddha couldn't stop wars. He could stop human suffering um, you know, among all of the, the people he met, the people who could hear, who could understand, who were ready to listen. You know, that, that he could do, but he couldn't stop people fighting each other. So we have we are limited in what we can do, but uh, much less limited than we imagine. I would say we also have a very severe limitation of of time. So uh, I don't know if there's anybody waiting with a a quick question. Um, if there are, we could maybe do one more, but I think we need to draw to a close in a few minutes. Well, maybe we'll end with the, um, a very lovely chant. We'll chant it in Pali, the Reflections on Universal Wellbeing. And um, I find it's actually in some ways even more meaningful in Pali um, because my mind doesn't sort of get involved with thinking about the words. It's much more of a heart uh, feeling. 
So I suggest that we do this chant together. Make sure you stay muted. And just focus in the heart and just allow the energy of the heart to, to radiate to whatever situation, whatever beings um, come into your mind, you know, whatever, you know, arise for you. And don't forget yourself. The first section is, may I abide in well-being, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety. Yeah. May I be free from these things. May I maintain well-being in myself. And then wishing the same for others, that they may be relieved from all suffering, that they may celebrate the good fortune. I don't mean having lots of money. I mean spiritual wealth. In the goodness and the beauty of humanity. And just recognizing the power of karma. All beings are the owners of their actions, heir to their actions, and so on. This wonderful equanimity. So I'll chant it and you're welcome to join in. <clears throat> Page 40. Mm. <clears throat> Ahang sukito homi, Nido ko homi, Awero homi, Bia pacha homi, Nigo homi, Suki hatanang pariharami. Sabe sata sukita hontu Sabe sata hawera hontu Sabe sata habia pacha hontu Sabe sata haniga hontu Sabe sata sukiha tanang pariharantu Sabe sata sapaduka pamochantu. Sabe sata latha sampatito mawiga chantu. Sabe sata kamasaka kamadayada kamayoni kamabandu kamapati sarana. Yankamankari santi kalayanangwa papatangwa. So we'll finish with the closing homage. Tipano Bagawato Sawata Sanko Sankang Namami so. I chance just a song to the city. Thank you so much for leaving this evening's class. Um, as usual, very inspiring, beautiful words and sentiments to reflect on. Um, according to my diary, and I'm going to confirm that, I think we see you again um, at the end of July on the 18th, which I'll confirm by, um, by email. Or oh, you'll see you next week, of course, you're teaching next week as well. So we have a treat of greeting you and, and hearing your, your reflections next week. So thank you so much for this evening's teachings. Really very grateful. Thank you. And I wish you all the best and look forward to seeing you all next week, virtually. Thank you.